when uh, when we talk about all of the positive things that we'll get with quantum computing, um, we have to worry about what what are the bad things that might happen. Cryptography is the one that comes to mind, right? Yes, and that's I think the most obvious one. If you think about now, we've got a uh, a quantum computer that can operate much, much, much faster than a classical computer. Yeah. Then the question is, could it possibly unwind some of the standards that exist today in cryptography, RSA, and things like that? Yeah. And the answer is yes. Everyone, David Bumble coming to you from Cisco Live with two very special guests. We're talking about a topic that I know a lot of you are interested in: quantum quantum computing encryption, but there's a lot more. Can you introduce yourselves and let's get into talking about quantum. Hi, thanks for having us. I'm Bill Gartner and I have responsibility for Cisco's optical systems and optics. Hi, thanks again for having us as well, uh, having me as well. Uh, I am Rezon Ejabati. I am a head of quantum research with one of the research group uh, in Cisco. So Bill, we were talking offline. There's more to quantum than quantum computing, but you can perhaps give us an update. What's the state of quantum? Sure. So I would say, first of all, quantum, I think, is at its nascent stage, very early stage, um, but it offers a lot of promise yep. and ve some very interesting possibilities will arise with, with quantum networks and quantum computing. Mm -hmm. First of all, one of the, I think, key attributes of a quantum network is really the reliance on something called a qubit, which is a very, very hard thing for most people to understand. It's relying on quantum mechanics. And the idea of a qubit is that it's not a one or a zero, but it's somewhere in between. If you think about what that might, might allow, it allows for very, very, very parallel processing of information, which turns into very fast processing yeah. of information. And, and that's really what quantum computing uh, holds as a promise, is to rely on this quantum mechanics, the basic of quantum mechanics, relying on qubits and doing things much, much faster than classical computers. And so some of the use cases that, that people envision for quantum computing would be things like um, simulating physical, the physical world in a way that we can't do today. Yep. Uh, simulating weather systems, for instance, um, and doing that very rapidly. Uh, drug discovery, uh, do, geno genome sequencing, or, or processing a ton of data for, for uh, genetics in a way that could turn information around very quickly. So it, would, it really has amazing potential. Um, so that's kind of quantum computing. Another application of quantum is in sensing. And wh what the, the, uh, the idea there is that, again, using principles of quantum mechanics, you can sense things at a very, very, very uh, micro level. Okay. Um, that could be used in things like uh, navigation or in uh, geology and trying to assess you know, where things like oil wells might might be best positioned um, at a much more accurate level than what we can do with conventional sensors. Now, of course, when, uh, when we talk about all of the positive things that we'll get with quantum computing, um, we have to worry about what what are the bad things that might happen? Cryptography is the one that comes to mind, right? Yes, and that's, I think, the most obvious one. If you think about now we've got a, uh, a quantum computer that can operate much, much, much faster than a classical computer, yeah. um, then the question is, could it possibly um, unwind some of the standards that exist today in cryptography, RSA, and things like that? Yeah. And the answer is yes. And part of the reason the answer is yes is, there was this uh, very smart guy, mathematician named Shor, who came up with an algorithm that basically said, if we could process things sufficiently fast using this algorithm, we could, we could effectively uh, decrypt what is today very solid encryption standards. And so there is a fear yep. that when a quantum computer becomes realizable, and we're years away from that really being like ubiquitously available, but when that happens, then the encryption standards that we know and love today are going to become uh, vulnerable. Yep. And so that then leads to, could we actually use quantum to, uh, to provide a better, a better secure path yep. in, an, in a network, for yep. instance? And that's done today. We have things called QKD, okay. which are quantum key distribution uh, solutions that allow us to, again, relying on quantum technology, 
do things in a very, very secure way. The uh, the challenge with QKD is that it, it's fairly cumbersome. Okay. It's a separate set of equipment that has to sit next to a router or switch. That um, that QKD is is has to be maintained. It has to be provisioned. Um, so, as an example, Cisco communicates with third party QKD devices using something called the Skip protocol, which was developed as a way to exchange information between, for instance, a router and a QKD device. Yep. And those devices are deployed today in really, really like ultra secure environments where they just can't take any chance. Now, one of the things that's happening in the industry is that NIST has, uh, has developed a, what, it w- what will be a standard for mathematical algorithms that will actually be, uh, be much more robust than, than conventional security okay. encryption approaches. And they have, uh, they're about to standardize, it will happen this year, they're about to standardize on four different mathematical algorithms that will, will allow us then to actually embed the algorithm in a router. That's called PQC. And uh, PQC will allow us to embed the algorithm in a router and provide a very secure path that really, really, it, in many cases, but not all, obviates the need for a uh, QKD device. So QKD is sort of today's technology. QKD will have a very, very long life for the ultra-secure applications. PQC is something that's coming within the next few years. We'd expect to see that deployed in network devices. And, but both will coexist. There'll be, a, there'll be an application for both. So we're very excited about that. And then I, the other thing I would say is quantum computing has some fantastic use cases, some real promise in terms of things like drug discovery and healthcare and pr- solving problems that today, optimization problems, for instance, that we can't even contemplate solving, like really, really tough logistics or supply chain optimization. Some really promising things, some negative things. I think people have thought pretty pretty well about how to counteract the bad guys out there. That's the worry. That's the worry. Um, and the, the only other thing I would say is the, the uh, state of the art of the technology today is very early stage, but we expect that we're going to have to now network computers, just like we had to network classical computers. And we may have to net- build networks that are quant- based on quantum technology. So I'm going to ask you some questions that I hear in the YouTube comments often or things that I see people saying. And it's great to talk to experts like yourselves to you know, either say it's true or it's, it, you know, it's nonsense. So I think first question, does quantum computing actually exist today? It does not. It, it ex, there, there are examples of quantum computers that exist in research labs primarily. Reza has recently joined Cisco from a research lab. Um, but, but you can't go buy a quantum computer on Amazon today. But like companies like Google or Cisco have quantum computers? There, there are quantum computers, but the, there is no useful one. I mean, the useful quantum computer has to be really big, multiple millions of qubits, what they call it. At the moment, we are uh, less than a thousand qubit, at the best estimation, even a few hundreds, I would say. So when do you think it'll be a reality? I don't want to put you on the spot, but no, like... Uh, I think in three or five years, we will be in a situation that we can produce in a number a small size quantum computers, but to achieve the useful one, we need somebody like Cisco has developed the right technology to connect them together to achieve the size of the millions. Um, that's in three, five years. If you want to think monolithically in millions, I would say more than 10 years away. 2030 is kind of the, the target date for when, when we need to start worrying about the threat of a quantum computer. People say that RSA is dead, but based on what you've just told me, that's perhaps in the future. Certainly in the future, 2030 at the earliest. But it's, it is possible that all the cryptography that we use today could be broken. With a, with a quantum computer at scale, yes. Yeah, I think uh, that quantum computer at scale, but there is a, also a slight worry to have an adversary with a malicious intent, with the sufficient resources, can store to wait 10 years for a computer to become available and break it. But you, the argument is that if 10 years time, that the information that you store 10 years ago is useful or not, that's another argument. But that's with sufficient resources, you can store and wait. Yeah, I think that for, for a lot of people who are watching, a lot of people in the audience are into cyber and they hear these things like RSA could be broken. All the encryption algorithms, AES could be broken. So it is possible, correct? It but is possible. Not today. Yeah, yeah, it is possible. But it, I, I think it, it also will take a sophisticated actor because you have to have access, for instance, if it's, a, if it's on the fiber, you have to have access to that fiber and somehow do that in a way that's not going to 
perturb the signal. That's a, that's a very challenging problem today. So you, you kind of have to connect a lot of dots and said, if you could do this and if you could do that, if you could get access to the fiber, if you could somehow tap the fiber in a way that you're not corrupting the original signal and you can somehow insert signals into the fiber, then you could theoretically create a situation that would be a threat. A lot of things have to happen. So it's, it, this is not, a, uh, this is not a, like an, a, a, a threat that's going to be available for the garden variety uh, hacker. And that's good to know because I think it's, it, it allays that fear that people have that the, the, the sky is falling, all the stuff that we're relying on is, 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 is going to be broken soon. So that's not yeah, true. Yeah, I don't think that's true. And also governments already for critical information putting a measure, measure for quantum safe, not quantum cryptography, quantum safe practices, meaning like what Bill said, post-quantum cryptography or other methods that people ensure that if somebody cannot store it now and recover, uh, break it later on as well. Yeah. And I would say that I mentioned PQC earlier, that is expected to be standardized this year. That will be implemented within the next few years. So yeah. by the time a quantum computer is really available and you solve some of these other problems of how you get access and corrupt the signal, um, PQC will be much more ubiquitously deployed, uh, really reducing that threat as well. So there's a lot of eyes on this problem in the industry. You both have been in the industry for a number of years. Can you talk to your younger self? First question is, would you recommend someone get into quantum computing today? What other advice would you give your younger self? My, my view is that we see in the industry and also in academic, because I come from academic life as well, there is a massive shortage of skills okay. on the quantum engineering. The problem is that most of the young generation, they, when they hear about the quantum, think about the quantum mechanics or pure quantum physics or quantum math, which is our pure science, by itself is valid, but not everybody is meat and bread or butter. Yeah. So, uh, but now it's becoming so advanced, it's becoming engineering. We need a software engineer, we need a hardware engineer, we need a telecom engineer, we need a network engineer, or computer scientists that have an awareness of the quantum and can continue to build the technology for quantum networks, quantum computers. And that's something that we need to advocate for the grassroots in the schools and universities and to people and enter. It's not anymore quantum basic quantum physics or do sit in your room and do a discovery of quantum mechanics formula. So in other words, there's a lot of opportunities, right? For people of diverse skills. Plenty of opportunities. I think quantum is a very exciting area. We didn't talk about the physical layer issues at all, but there are many competing technologies for physical layer. The, 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 the answer to the question of what is the right uh, technology to, to, to transmit qubits or to develop qubits, yeah. that's still a uh, problem that has to be solved. There are a number of competing solutions out there. That's at the very physical layer. And then as you move up, you have different challenges and problems that have to be solved. Like, how do you take those qubits and build a computer? Yeah. How do you take that those elements that you've now got and network them together? How do you network across a, a larger area network? Many, many problems that are ahead of us. I think very exciting challenges. Some re So people that I think are interested in getting into a, a very exciting uh, technology area that has a lot of problems that need to be solved, it's a great place to be thinking about. And that's really where Cisco's interest is, yep. is in like the yeah. networking of quantum information. It's very early stage. Cisco has made an investment in one company in the industry. The company is Aliro Quantum. And Aliro's taken a very different approach. They're not building classic quantum solutions. They're not worried about qubit, physical layer. They're worried about how do you think about managing a quantum network? Um, how do you think about planning, op optimizing, yeah. uh, simulating, and then managing a quantum network. And so we're using investments like the investment we've made in Aliro to really plug into the industry, understand how the ecosystem is going to evolve, and make sure that we're, we're ready when the quantum industry is ready. I just want to turn it over to um, Reza for a moment, because Reza leads our research activities in uh, Cisco. Maybe he could comment a little bit on what, what Cisco is thinking about in terms of some of the, the, the tough problems that we have to go That'd solve. Right. Yeah. So uh, what I want to say, I mean, uh, what Bill uh, says to continue on that and complement it. In Cisco, uh, we have a research team which works on quantum. We are, there are a bunch of scientists, there are academic background and some great engineer from engineering background. But our difference from the research institutes that work in university is that we work closely with business units and we address practical yep. solution, we design practical solution, address real problem. So our motto for research is to design a practical, useful quantum internet, a quantum network that make, can make quantum technology accessible 
for Cisco customers and Cisco users. Yeah. And one of the things, as Bill mentioned, we think is make a real difference and is important for people to get access to it is a quantum computer. But to have a useful quantum computer, you need really a big quantum computer. And a big quantum computer, you cannot uh, build it monolithically. You need to connect a bunch of quantum computers together to get the scale and size that you can address drug discovery, for example, as Bill mentioned, or uh, optimization problem that uh, for weather forecasting. What we are thinking in Cisco, we build a network solution for quantum data center. Why we, we do that? Because it adds practicality and usefulness. We want to be in a control environment, a short distance, connect the quantum computer that we can build, let's say in three years time, the commercially become available, the small size quantum computers. We can connect them, large number of them together and make it useful quantum computer that can solve real problem yeah. and give the access, uh, uh, give them access to user and provide them a service to user. That's what we are focusing in my research team to build the hardware technology, software stack and protocol to, to add this interconnectivity between quantum computers. And obviously we do some of it in, inside the uh, Cisco internally. Yep. We develop IP technology for that. Also, some of them are partnered with the Cisco investment and ecosystem that Bill in Cisco, like Aliro that uh, was mentioned uh, by Bill. The one thing I would add to what Reza just said is that, and part of the reason it's very interesting for us, is that he's going to really look deeply at how, how do you solve the problem of networking computers within a data center. But we, we expect to gain insights about the broader networking problem yeah. in doing that, because networking computers inside a data center is going to tell us a little bit about what problems have to be solved for networking. Now, when we take it outside the data center, we obviously obviously have to worry about things like distance. That becomes a much, much bigger challenge for quantum. Uh, but we're going to learn a lot about the problem of networking, even in a small world of a data center. So it's great to hear your take on quantum and quantum computing. But, you know, listening to you and other people, it sounds like quantum is a bit of vaporware, perhaps. It's not here today. Are there any concrete examples that you can share of quantum or quantum computing being used for something? Yes, in Cisco, in my team, we recently developed a, what we call a quantum random number generator. Okay. And that's a very important piece of hardware technology, which has many applications. If you think about a random number, any many applications in your daily life, from security to your financial transaction, to your uh, even gaming, when you yep. do the online gaming, or uh, gambling, they, they use the random number. But any random number at the moment is produced digitally. Yep. And digital random numbers, if you are a little bit into the computer and algorithm development, you know they call it pseudo-random. Yes, exactly. So pseudo-random means that if you repeat it enough, yep. you, you can repeat the random. It's not true random. So the only physical phenomenon that can create the true random number is the quantum effect. So we use that quantum effect and we develop a quantum random number generator, which can generate a true random and we make it available through uh, cloud or even as a hardware to the Cisco customer so they can deploy it and create a true random for various applications that they have. And that's available today? Available today. Thank you so much for sharing like a practical example because again, you guys have addressed the issue of like, is it real? Is it gonna affect us today? Really wanna thank you for sharing and you know, also helping the next generation and inspiring them. Thanks so much. Great, thank you for having us. Thank you.